I doubt that anyone on that Pentecost day 2,000 years ago woke up with any appreciation of what was about to take place. Pentecost means 50 and was called the Feast of Weeks because it took place on the 50th day after the Passover, seven weeks, and the Feast of First Fruits. It signified the end of the barley harvest and was a holy convocation instituted by God and uh, requiring every Jewish believer to attend. Therefore, the town, the city of Jerusalem was full of Jews from every nationality, and most woke up expecting it was just going to be another ordinary Pentecost celebration. But something else had happened that year, 50 days earlier, before Pentecost, a man called Jesus had died on the evening of the Passover, and three days later he had risen from the dead. So over the next 40 days after his resurrection, he appeared to over 500 people. And then 10 days before Pentecost, just before he ascended to heaven, he told his followers, who only numbered 120 at that time, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's recorded in Acts 1-4. Then the day of Pentecost came and a new age dawned. Acts 2-24 records that suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in foreign languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now a crowd gathered and each person heard the gospel being proclaimed in their own language. So Peter then stands up and explains this phenomenon. In Acts 2, 17 to 21, he says these words. This is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And then verse 21, the prophecy from Joel ends with these words, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, uh, Peter is quoting from the Old Testament prophet Joel from chapter 3, verses 28 to 32. And by so doing, he, he links the whole Old Testament period with the start of the New Testament period, explaining that Joel's prophecy hundreds of years before was now being fulfilled that day of Pentecost. This, what, what they were seeing was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit also prophesied by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, 31. This was the start of the church, which was to be all-inclusive, no longer just limited to one race. The Spirit was given to all God's people without distinction, sons, daughters, young men and old, irrespective of race, class, or station. Even on my servants will the Spirit be poured out, says the prophecy. Uh, Last year we had great fun in our church where a, a portion of the Acts passage was read in 21 different languages. It is the church for everybody, and Pentecost started at the start of the last days. So it was the day the church began with the promise of prophetic power for all believers as we go out and communicate the word of God, the truth of God's word, and with the promise that we will have dreams and visions uh, being given to the people of God, which I'll speak about just now. 3,000 people got saved that day, and it grew to 5,000 within a few weeks. By chapter 4, the church was praying together, worshiping together, sharing together, just what a church should be. This was also the start of what is called the age of the gospel, where anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. So this was it. But I get ahead of myself. I want to take you back to the Old Testament, to a place where this event was predicted by one of God's prophets, perhaps some thousand years earlier. So let's have a brief recap of Israel's history to try and place when this prophecy took place. 
After the death of King Solomon, the nation of Israel split up into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel with its capital at Samaria and the southern kingdom of Judah with its capital in Jerusalem. Uh, then both kingdoms began to turn away from God and worship false gods of the heathen. And, and God sent prophet after prophet to them to call them to repentance and to warn them that if they failed to repent, uh, they would be taken into captivity. Now, neither kingdom listened to, to the warning. And in 722 BC, the Assyrians attacked the northern kingdom and took the inhabitants captive. A hundred years or so later, the southern kingdom was also taken captive, this time by the Babylonians, which was the ruling empire at that time. So God had allowed his people to be taken into exile because of their disobedience. Again, again, he sent them prophets, even while they were in exile, to call them to repentance. Now, Ezekiel was one of the prophets whom God used while the nation was in Babylon during the exile. And you can imagine the state of the people in exile. They were in captivity. They were far from their homeland, seemingly abandoned by their God. The nation was discouraged, disheartened, and depressed, without life and without hope, like a bunch of old dried bones. Psalm 137 verses 1 to 4 gives us a sense of some of the desperation, sadness, and sorrow that those people had in exile. Uh, this song that I'm going to read to you from Psalm 137 verses 1 to 4 wasn't written by Boney M. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung up our harps. For there our captors asked of us a song. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing the Lord's song while we're in a foreign land, says the song. How can we sing the Lord's song while we're in a foreign land? So this song was a lament by the nation while they were in exile. Now, all the news wasn't bad. God was faithful and he promised the nation through Ezekiel that they would one day return and inhabit their land again. And often the promise of a physical return was also coupled with a strong spiritual element, which promised that something far greater than a physical return to Jerusalem would take place. There was always the promise of a, a final spiritual return to God. And listen to Ezekiel in chapters 36, verse 24 to 27, promising that spiritual return along with the physical. For I'll take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So there's the promise of the physical return, but a spiritual renewal of Israel, which hasn't occurred yet. And so God is saying they will come back to their own land, but be given one day a new spirit and a new heart after God. So they returned. We understand they did return, but the promise of spiritual renewal only took place or only was made up uh, available from Pentecost. And the second part is referred to as the new covenant when God would do an eternal work by his spirit. And you can read about that in Jeremiah 31, 31. It refers to an outpouring of the spirit, which would occur in people's hearts. And uh, that's when the church would be birthed, which we know happened at Pentecost. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 37, which follows on from that, we get this vision of dry bones. It's a vision that Ezekiel gets uh, in Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones and on the, on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. 
This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and I will, you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendon and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then God said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Now, why do I read the story at Pentecost? The reason is because the Christian life sometimes oscillates between the euphoria of Pentecost and the valley of dry bones. Sometimes churches feel like they're in the age of revival, and other time they feel they're in the stage of dry bones. And the situation of our world is not helping today, state to some churches under COVID and individuals can be like dry bones. You feel your work is struggling, you might have been made redundant or you're battling with addiction or your marriage is breaking up, your health is not in a good state or you know, that of a family member, you might have even lost someone you love, your faith is failing. Now dry bones would adequately describe your situation, it appears hopeless and that's the time when God often shows up and in the vision Ezekiel speaks God's word and the bones have life. Now the Hebrew word for, for breath and wind is ruach. It means breath, it means spirit, it means life. God can give life to dead bones and we need to move out of the valley of dry bones to the place where God is able to pour out his spirit again into your life. So by way of application, let me suggest three things. Firstly, you need your faith to be restored in the valley. You need the spirit to do something for you and refresh and renew your faith. God can come through. It doesn't matter how bad the situation is. The Jews were in a bad position uh, in captivity. Their situation seemed hopeless, and that is exactly the time that God moves so that he can receive the glory. So look at what happened historically in answer to that prophecy. In 539 BC, the Babylonians were defeated by the Medes and Persians and were allowed to physically return to their homeland and rebuild again. So gird up your loins in faith. Don't get defeated by the circumstances. If you're a Joseph, don't focus on the jail. Dream of being the prime minister of Egypt and feeding your people. If you're a Moses, don't look at the waters of the Red Sea. Dream about leading the nation out of Egypt. If you're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, don't look at the furnace. Trust God. If you're a Daniel, don't worry about the lions. Look to God. Peter, don't look at the waves. Just walk on the water. If you're the early church, don't get intimidated by the persecution. Go and fulfill the calling to spread the gospel. Church of today, don't get discouraged by the declining state of the world, the increase in sin, and by the devastation of this COVID virus. You can overcome the world and the evil one. Look up to the one who has done so on the cross for you. Don't let your circumstances define you and dictate to you. Overcome by faith those circumstances. 
And now this leads to my second point. Apart from uh, refreshing our faith, I want to suggest that the way we can be encouraged to get out of the valley can be taken from Joel's prophecy quoted by Peter at Pentecost. God's promise was that your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Now those verses are often overlooked. But what are these dreams and visions that Peter is speaking about that the Holy Spirit gives us? Are they dreams of the Springboks perhaps beating the Lions in rugby or dreams about the girl you're hoping to marry? No, not at all. These are spiritual dreams and visions that the Spirit of God gives. They're for a purpose. Scripture says without a vision, the people perish. A vision is when you see ahead by faith something as real which has not yet come into existence. In our minds, we see the reality long before it exists. Believers who have been used by God are given visions and dreams of what can be, and then by faith, they become part of the fulfillment of that dream. Now, the vision we have is not some personal ambition that we try to perform in our own strength. It is not some commitment to kick a personal habit. It is not some self-centered or self-gratifying dream that we have always harbored, perhaps to become a rock singer or something like that. It is God's dream for you. What does he want you to become? What does he want you to do? What does he want you to achieve for him? What mighty work has he in store for you that you will have eternal impact on the lives of other people? I want and ask that you request of God to give you a vision of what can be in the future for yourself, for your country, for your town, for your church, for your school, for your family, for your marriage, and your personal spiritual life. And then get out of the valley in faith and start to fulfill his dream for you. Let me give you a testimony about a vision and dream that I had in my younger Christian life. There were Youth for Christ camps that used to hold Youth Week in South Africa every year. And during the bush war in Zimbabwe, we stopped attending. We weren't able to attend. But after independence, we wanted to reestablish a Christian camp in Zimbabwe. And God gave us the vision. And we believed and sensed that God wanted Zimbabwe to have its own youth camp that would cross racial, denominational, and geographical barriers. And I saw hundreds of young people gathering together to worship God once a year and have fun together. I shared the vision with Andy Shaw, a friend of mine, a youth leader, and then we shared it with 10 other youth leaders, then 30 in Arari, prominent leaders, both black and white, mainline and charismatic. And we then engaged the other towns, Bulawayo, Matari, Gweru, and Maswingu, Maswingo. And then we planned our first camp at Peterhouse. And I remember all the work and combined effort coming together on our first night as nearly 300 young people worshiped God with a man called Julia Mackey leading those young people in a song, Let Your Living Water Flow Over My Soul. And when we as the leaders heard that song and saw the people, we realized the vision had come to pass and we wept. And then the following year, another man, Rob Finn, had another vision to build a Christian camp at Mizvika Day, uh, Mizvika Day Dam, uh, for Youth Encounter, which it came to be called, to hold 500 people at Sanganai Creek. And his vision came to pass. And when we left Zimbabwe in 2003, Youth Encounter had been running for 15 years with 500 young people coming once a year from all over Zimbabwe to worship the Lord. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Christian, dream big and then seek to fulfill those dreams in him. And then thirdly and lastly, as we go back into the New Testament, you will note from Joel's prophecy quoted by Peter that the prophecy ends with these words. It's recorded in Acts 2, 19 to 20, when God says, I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Now that obviously refers to the dramatic signs immediately preceding the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's closing time. So now is the time, the church age, the time of evangelism initiated at Pentecost, when we've got to get out there and get the message out. We're in the last days, and therefore this is the last opportunity for mankind to call on the name of the Lord. And God has given man 2,000 years to get his act together. He has given 2,000 years for the gospel to get across the globe. And it's pretty much crossed the globe. Anyone can hear the, the gospel in their own language now. 
This age of the Spirit won't last forever. The window of opportunity will not always be open. We're not far from closing time when the last believer will come into the fold and then Christ will come. Now is the time. Now is our opportunity. Not next year, but now, because when he comes, he will come like a thief in the night when we least expect him. And then there will never be another opportunity to call on the name of the Lord. Not another opportunity to tell people about Jesus, to, to mention Christ to members of our family. Friends, with the celebration of Pentecost this year, it is time to get out of the Valley of Dry Bones in faith, to ask God, give me, renew my faith, and give me your spirit to enable me to have a vision of what you want me to be and to become and how I can make a difference. And God, give me a sense of urgency to tell others about you while I have this opportunity. Bless you all with those words. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we might be diligent now. Give us new faith, new vision, and an urgency to tell people about you while we have time. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. God bless you all.